Fierce debate over the consumer carbon price was reinvigorated this week. A hotly anticipated report from the parliamentary budget watchdog has both the Liberals and Conservatives claiming victory. The report reaches broadly the same conclusions as the previous analysis, namely most Canadians will get back more in rebates than they pay in carbon taxes by 2030 when the price reaches $170 a tonne, even when including the direct and indirect costs associated with it. But most Canadians are worse off financially once all other economic impacts are factored in. Now we only look at the consumer charge, so obviously the impact is lower. It's not as much of a negative impact. But still, on average, the average household is still worse off when taking into account the economic. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev is reiterating his call, meanwhile, for a carbon tax election. And that report confirmed everything I've been saying about this horrible tax, this ripoff. It showed that 60% of Canadians pay more in the carbon tax than they get back in rebates. 100% of middle class Canadians lose out. I spoke with Environment and Climate Change Minister Stephen Guilbeault Friday following the release of the PBO's report. You said upon the release of the updated report that it, quote, shows that carbon pricing is the most cost-effective way to fight climate change. The report concludes, as we said in that introduction, that when the impact on the economy is factored in, the carbon tax ends up being a net loss for Canadians. So how can you reach that conclusion? Well, two things, uh, Vashi. First, I'm not the one saying that, uh, that carbon pricing is the most effective way to fight climate change. Page 9 of the Parliamentary Budget Officer's report says that uh, most economists agree that it is the best way to fight climate change. Second, in the introduction, you said that the, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, when he looks at all of the other indirect uh, costs uh, or benefits to the economy, well, in fact, his report specifically says that he doesn't look at all the other indirect uh, impact, economic impact of, of carbon pricing. He does not look at the benefits the, of, of carbon pricing and the billions of dollars that it has generated in investment, thousands of jobs created. Like he specifically says, I didn't look at that. He also says in terms of indirect economic impact, I'm not looking at the impacts of climate change to, to, to the Canadian households, like how much this is impacting uh, their budget on an annual basis. He says this is something I might do in the into the future, but he's not doing it now. What he says is when you look at the direct cost, he says most Canadians are better off than with, with carbon pricing than without carbon pricing. Yeah, I guess to parse apart that answer, yes, when looking at even the indirect costs, right? So the debate has often said, you know, the price it attaches to the extra cost to food and stuff. Even when he factors that in, the rebate for the majority of Canadians will outweigh the cost that they pay. It's when he takes into account numbers provided, for example, by the government about the economic impact of the consumer portion of this, the, uh, the impact it will have, for example, on investment income and incomes more generally, that he arrives at the conclusion he did. You, you pointed out two things. First of all, that he didn't model out the benefits or the jobs created uh, associated with the, the carbon tax, nor the impact of climate change. On the first, and we'll go through both, on the first, what is the model for that? I, I, I have never heard from your government a specific amount of jobs that this tax specifically creates because I think it's clear just based on political reaction from like-minded premiers and politicians, not conservatives in this case, I'm thinking of David Eby and Wab Kanu and Jagmeet Singh and Andrew Fury, as well as people who are just existing in the world, running small businesses, that they certainly don't feel that this has been r responsible for economic development, for example. We've, um, we have published numerous analysis of the economic benefits, and there's been a, a, num there, a number of independent uh, analysis that have been published. But the, the, the consensus or the rough estimates that right now is that carbon pricing is generating about $25 billion of annual investment in clean technologies, in, in, in renewable energy, in, in zero emission vehicle technologies, batteries, and so on and so forth. So that's... And, and, the, the other interesting thing about, about the parliamentary budget officer's report is that he points to the fact that it, most Canadians are better off except the wealthiest. And I think that's where, that's why, that, that, if we're looking for a reason as to why Pierre Poilievre is so opposed to this, that's why. Because his rich friends, uh, recently uh, oil executive uh, CEOs organized a fundraiser for, for Pierre Poilievre. They're putting pressure on him to put an end to this. I can assure you, Vashi, that oil executives aren't organizing fundraisers for me, not happening. So I, I think we, if we're looking for a reason why the Conservative Party is so obsessed 
with, with carbon pricing. That's the reason. But actually, when you're looking at the fiscal side of things, yes, it does so that there, that there is a show, pardon me, that there is a progressive impact. When you're looking at the uh, fiscal and economic por portion of things or, or analysis of things, it's very broad based that Canadians are worse off. It's not just the highest quintile. Is it perhaps that and, and I like I separate the conservative criticism for a moment because I know that's what your government likes to focus on. So much of that criticism comes from within your own your 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 own ranks, progressive side of politics. Like, is Wab Canoe against this because he wants to help his rich friends? Is Andrew Fury against this because he wants to help his rich friends? No, I think in the case in both the case of Premier Fury and and the NDP, whether it's the the NDP in Manitoba, BC, or federal NDP, uh, they cave to the pressure. I mean, there is a lot of pressure on progressive politicians around this. So the parliamentary budget officers, officer says it's the most effective way of fighting climate change. Most econ economists who have written about this says it's the most effective way to fight climate change, including a Nobel laureate who, 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 who got his laureate specifically for his work on, on, on carbon pricing. Um, but the Conservative Party has decided to put pressure, and we saw Jack Mead Singh, for example, cave on carbon pricing after Pierre Poliev came out and said, you, you should stop supporting carbon pricing. And that's what Jack Mead Singh did. And the same thing, unfortunately, with Premier Eby, for, for whom I have the greatest respect in, in British Columbia. We saw the rise of the Conservative Party in British Columbia. Um, same type of argument as federal, ND, federal Conservatives on carbon pricing. And we saw the, the BCNDP cave under, on, uh, under that pressure. It is, you know, it would be much easier for me, Bashi, from a political perspective to say, okay, well, 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 we'll stop doing that. But it's the right thing to do. If you're serious about climate change, if you're not serious about climate change, like Pierre Poiliev, then of course you don't want to do anything. To, to, you don't want to put measures to, to, to fight climate change. And, and you know, the, the planet and Canada can go to hell in a handbasket. He doesn't care. But if you're serious about fighting climate change, this is... Not the only way, but the best the best way of doing it. It should be the number one tool in your toolbox of fighting climate change. Uh, what role, though, did your government play in sort of, I guess, promulgating the kind of pressure that you describe that ultimately bared down on more progressive politicians in this country? And I'll tell you why I ask more specifically. So you point to economists that have labeled this as a very cost-effective way of doing things. There's probably nobody more at the forefront of that, and it's someone I've been interviewing for years on this subject, than Professor Chris Reagan, whom I also interviewed when your government gave a carve-out to home heating, which primarily affected Atlantic Canada. The Prime Minister made that announcement surrounded by Atlantic Canadian Liberal MPs. Mr. Reagan, Professor Reagan at the time, anticipated that that would be the death of this policy as written by your party. So for you to be sort of, you know, critical of everyone else for caving to the pressure, what responsibility do you bear for being the architect of that pressure? I think we're doing much better in terms of how we communicate uh, this to, 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 to Canadians. Uh, next week on Tuesday, people will be receiving their quarterly payment in provinces where the federal pricing system is, is applied. Uh, we now have all the banks and financial institutions on site who will label it properly. It wasn't labeled properly before, so people didn't even know they were receiving it. We're, we're seeing a, an increasing number of Canadians who understand that they're getting the Canada carbon rebate, that they're seeing the, the benefits of this. It wasn't like that six months ago, uh, Bashi. Um, so we're, we've put in place a number of things to ensure that there is a, a, a better understanding by Canadians of, of the benefit of the, the Canada carbon rebate. And, and, and it's changing. It's changing the debate. It let, for example, in July, last quarterly payment, more Canadians were talking about, were talking positively about the Canada carbon rebate than Canadians were talking about axe attacks. So we can shift the narrative on, on, on this. It's a, it's a lot of hard work and we have to sustain it. Respectfully, though, Minister, I, I wasn't asking you about a communications difficulty. I was asking you about the role that, that your government played in creating the backlash to this by essentially offering a carve-out that was politically motivated to Atlantic Canada. And I know you're going to say it wasn't politically motivated, that there are other homes that qualify for this across the country, but 25% of the homes in Atlantic Canada use home heating oil versus, I think, it's 6% in the rest of the country. Plus, Minister Goody Hutchings came on this program a about a year ago, somewhere in the neighborhood of that, and said, that if other parts of the country wanted to qualify for uh, a carve-out like that, they should elect more Liberals? 
I can't speak to, to, to what my, my colleague said. What I can tell you is that in my home province of Quebec, where I am now, there are more Quebecers using home heating oil than in all of Atlantic Canada put together. Not so as a the, portion of the resources used, though. No, not in, but, but in absolute terms. There are more people in Quebec that use oil to heat their homes than in all of Atlantic Canada. That's that's a simple fact. It's not proportionally, but, but in absolute terms. Um, and, and the concept of carbon pricing is to incentivize different behaviors. And, and what we realized with home heating oil is that most of the people who are still using this form of, 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 of heating systems tend to be poorer uh, and, and not have the, the money necessary to invest into, into more efficient and, and cleaner heating systems. The pause is to help us put in place measures, and we've deployed hundreds of millions of dollars across the country from BC to, 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 to the Atlantic provinces, to the north, to help people make that transition so that I mean, if, if, if you're using this tool to incentivize change, but people can't change because they don't have the mean to it, then then it may be working from an environmental perspective, but it's certainly not working from a social perspective. And, and, and But that's us, kind of the point, right? That's the point these, that uh, people these, in other parts of the country that aren't even using just home heating oil feel. They don't feel like it's easy to buy an electric car, for example, yet. And I know that your government has plans in place to help incentivize that further and help make that more affordable, but right now they just don't feel it is. And they feel like unless they elect liberals, that falls on deaf ears. Deaf ears, pardon me. The sales of so sales of electric vehicles have quadrupled in the last three years in, in in Canada. In Quebec, one in five vehicles sold right now is an electric vehicle. In British Columbia, it's one in four. Um, it's it, it, it's happening. More and more people are are moving to, to heat pumps from from coast to coast to coast uh, across the country, and and we've deployed system to help them to help them do that. So we're not just saying. Climate change and fighting climate change is a societal challenge. So, of course, the federal government has a role to play. Provincial governments, most of them aren't, but they should be be, be part of this. But we want to we want to work with the public, which is why it's it's it's, it's kind of a carrot and stick approach. So we put in place regulations and system like carbon pricing, but at the same time, we are helping people with again, you know hundreds of millions of dollars, whether it's, uh, in fact, in, in, in terms of home energy retrofit, it's in the billions of dollars, uh, heat pump programs, electric vehicles, renewable energy. That's how we will help Canadians reduce their dependencies on fossil fuels, go for cleaner, cheaper, and more efficient uh, systems. Minister, just before I let you go, I wanted to ask you one more question about in your capacity as a Quebec minister, and it's about essentially what's been going back and forth with the Bloc Québécois and especially their proposal to boost old age security. As a minister of Quebec, are you okay with the Bloc determining government policy? No, well, absolutely not, which is why we voted against uh, this. So th their proposal, we're certainly in favor of, of, of supporting seniors, which is why we brought back the, the retirement age from, from 67 years which the previous government, Harper government, conservative government, put in place to 65. We've put in place a number of measures to support seniors, but what what the Bloc was proposing was, was fiscally irresponsible. It, it, it would cost $3 billion per year, and in many cases, it would go to people who don't need it. Uh, so we're certainly, and we're, we, we've agreed to, to, to sit down and talk with the Bloc in terms of what other measures that we, we could put in place, but but it was poor public policy and, and we voted against it. We, we're not going to be held hostage simply to extend the life of, of, of our government to something that makes absolutely no sense uh, for, from a fiscal and, and also from a social point of view. So just to be clear, if you do put something more on the table through working with the Bloc, it will be outside of this measure specifically? It, it, it won't be what the Bloc has proposed. So I'm, I'm not obviously personally involved in those conversations. I'm the environment minister. I'm not, not the minister responsible for, for, for seniors. But, but we, we have spoken about this as a, as a, as a collective. And, and we're willing to, to work with the NDP on this. Uh, unfortunately, the Conservatives aren't interested in, in working on, on this with us. But So it's not the fact that there's no more formal agreement with the NDP doesn't mean that we're not Talking to the NDP doesn't mean that we're not negotiating on, on specific elements. I certainly am on a number of, of my bills and, and initiatives that the NDP want us to, to deliver. The oil and gas cap, for, for example, very important for the NDP. Well, we need their support if they want us to put this in place. So those conversations are continuing with, with many of the parties uh, in, the, in the House of Commons, with the obvious exception of the Conservative Party of Canada. Okay, I'm going to leave it on that note. Minister, I appreciate your time as always. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Vashi. Have a good day.